ladies and gentlemen, Dr. David Guzik said about this passage. Numbers 25 tells the story of how the young women of Moab enticed the men of Israel to idolatry and immorality at Baal of Peor. In their idolatry, they ate sacrifices made to the dead. A plague broke out among them. God sent a plague as a judgment against the Israelites, against the people of God. And the plague was only stopped when righteous Phinehas brought God's judgment against an Israelite man and Moabite woman, apparently in the midst of immorality at or near the tabernacle itself. <clears throat> This act of righteousness stopped the plague. This brave and decided deed was so acceptable to God as a proof that there were some sincere souls in Israel that the deadly visitation went no further. In recognition of his righteous act, God made a covenant regarding the priesthood with Phinehas and his descendants. Ladies and gentlemen, as promised last week, uh, when I did the special uh, unscheduled uh, briefing about what President Trump said on Friday, I think it was Friday or Thursday, about how that he wanted the church is open immediately uh, and quite frankly and quite honestly uh, I told you that uh, President Trump is a politician and he's in the uh, process of trying to win re-election and I, I told you and wanted to encourage you not to allow yourself to get caught up in politics and start doing crazy things just because people are saying crazy things uh, and, and, and end up you, you end up sick or you end up with somebody who's sick in your family or you're a responsible pastor for uh, hundreds of others getting sick. And I, I encourage you not to reopen the churches. That's not necessary. If there ever was a group that can stay intact and uh, hear the message from God and fellowship even together uh, and do quite well without a building, it is the church. And, and always remember the church started in homes. Always remember the church started in homes. I predicted, I guess, about six, seven years ago that because of the foolishness going on in churches that uh, the churches are going to end up in the homes. And that's what I believe is happening. And I'm, I'm waiting on a young, innovative pastor to do like the president of uh, Twitter and the president of Facebook and just tell people, listen, we're going to keep the building. The building is paid for. We're going to get rid of the uh, extra buildings that we have. We're going to sell those, and we're going to give you the money. Uh, and uh, we are going to keep enough money in the bank always to keep the building up and the electricity on, utilities on, utilities, utilities going and everything. And we're going to just meet maybe once a month, or we're going to meet once a quarter, but we're going to stick with online ministry and, 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 and make the home the center of the church again. I'm waiting on a pastor. I'm not a pastor. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist. I do the work of a pastor. 
And I believe in the power of the home church. It's a very powerful thing. I'll tell you one thing about the home church. Uh, there's no showing off going on. Uh, you're not trying to impress people with nothing at the home church because everybody knows you. And it's a welcome experience to have a pastor beaming into your uh, household while you're still in your robe and you're drinking some coffee and eating a, um, a bagel. That's, that's, that's good stuff. That's good stuff right there. That's all right. In the words of Bishop Daniel White, Jr., my father, who is in heaven, that's all right. And so I am thankful to God that most churches did not open up this past Sunday uh, because the church is a unique situation uh, and environment that somehow the coronavirus feeds on. But most importantly, I believe that the coronavirus plague is against the church. I believe God allowed it to happen to shake up the church, to rebuke the church. Because we have been playing instead of praying. And we have not kept the Great Commission or the Great Commandment. And we've done some wicked, evil, ungodly things in and through the church. Just three things that I can mention right, I, I would mention right now. Uh, just um, constant adultery and fornication has taken place in churches for years now. Everybody knows it. Uh, the number two, the abuse, sexual abuse of children. Uh, has gone on for years in churches. God is not pleased with that. None of it. And then probably the greatest sin is the church has sanctioned along with the government homosexual, uh, the, the abomination of homosexuality, homosexual marriage, and the homosexual agenda. And so God is not pleased with that. And um, if the church and the government does not repent of these things and more, uh, the emphasis on money, uh, pastors uh, uh, taking money from the poor people and driving Bentleys and living in mansions and traveling on, on private jets and all of this foolishness, God is not pleased. And uh, so... My prayer has been that God would be thorough with us and break us and make us and mold us to be what he would have us to be. And uh, as you know, many, many hundreds, thousands of church folk, pastors, pastors' wives, deacons, ministers, associate ministers, children of pastors have died in this coronavirus plague out of that 100,000, according to this, uh, the statistics, by the way, too, uh, many are Christian and also, or, or many were in church. And not only that, uh, over 60% were black out of the 100,000 uh, from the inaccurate false counting, which I believe is north of quarter of a million. But I promised you last uh, Friday, I think it was, because I, I was not going to do a briefing on Friday, but then the president said this. And, and by the way, even uh, Dr. Robert uh, Jeffress was taken aback by the announcement. Evidently, President Trump did not discuss it with him. And uh, Pastor Jeffress called him and told him, that, well, we're not going to open up tomorrow, but we're going to open up in June, you know, and uh, June 7th, or something like that, which that's like two weeks away. And a few other pastors who are in that circle, they, they were, it, it appeared, they were somewhat taken aback by it. They said they appreciate, however, we 
will make that decision, basically, basically telling the president that you're not going to make it. We will make that decision uh, when we do that. And, uh, and these pastors are not stupid. They're wise because they are hearing the news reports of hundreds getting sick, pastors dying, priests dying, uh, uh, ministers dying, pastors' wives dying, multiple family members are dying, and so forth. So they're, they're, they're you know, they're, they're not going to be drawn into this little political thing you want to try to open up everything in a hurry and in a rush. Uh, and so uh, that's what's going on there. And I promise you that I would share with you uh, some of the things that are going on. And I may do this again tomorrow as well. Uh, add to this. Uh, I want you to know this. Number one, 90 to 120 people gathered after regular morning services at Friendship Baptist Church in rural Marion County, West Virginia, to mark the uh, pastor's anniversary, Laverna Horton's an sixth anniversary, at the church. That gathering at that one church in West Virginia is estimated to have infected 30% of the people who attended. Now, let me just help you a little bit. Help, let me help you understand something here. Why the governors and mayors uh, restricted churches. This is one of the reasons why. But the other reason why is because many of these people, these governors and mayors, are connected to these churches somehow. They have family members. They may be a member of the church. You know, in America, you can't be in politics and not have some kind of relationship with the church. So, so. It's, a, it's just foolishness to say that the governors and the mayors hate the church. That's ridiculous. But one of the reasons why these governors and these mayors restricted churches is because of what they've seen. Listen to me very carefully on TVN and on Daystar. And what have they seen? They've seen a whole lot of foolishness and not faith. They, they know the nature of some of us and how that we will say things like, bless God, we're just going to go on in the name of the Lord and, and we're going to just uh, trust God. We're his special king's kids and, and all of that and we're the head and not the tail and we're going to go right on into the beast, the monster called coronavirus plague and die. Don't get mad at me. I, I, I guarantee you that weighed in, in the minds of many of these governors and mayors because they know, they know some of us who talk like that. And, and listen to me very carefully. God used his ministers in the government to save the lives of many people. I know you don't like it. I know you're all about separation of church and state and all that. But you hear me and you hear me well. Contrary to this made up, listen to me, pumped up, phony little thing of the government is trying to hold churches back. That's all pumped up, fake, phony stuff that politicians do. Don't listen to that. I don't care if it's the president, the vice president, uh, whoever. That's a phony war. Don't get caught up in that. That's made up to try to make it seem like the liberal governors hate the church and uh, they don't want the church to open. They want to kill the churches. No, no, no. The churches have killed themselves by playing instead of praying and whoring around and, and got whoredom and adultery and fornication. Uh, having sex with children and raping children, 
molesting children and got homosexual ministers, and you have compromised everything with the city and the government anyway, trying to be accepted by them, you compromise the word of God, and they know that you don't have any power anyway with them. They're going, they're going, <clears throat> they can tell you anything they want to tell you, and you, and you better do it. Because they got the goods on you anyway, most of you. So don't come with that foolishness. Don't don't believe those lies and get caught up. You got got your people out there following some politician, and then because see, you hear me well. You can make them you, listen to me. You can make the people sign whatever kind of legal document you want. Is if Madea get sick, they're going to sue you. The family, the people who hate you in the first place, their family members, their grandchildren, their children, who they don't trust you anyway, preacher. And they're going to sue you, and they're going to get some money from you. If their grandmama died, Madea died. Because, you know, Madea going to come. If the pastor tell Madea to come, and come out there and give half her check that she got from the government, and half her Social Security check and everything else, uh, believe you me, when she gets sick and dies, she will die because she's already old. They're going to sue your socks off, and rightfully so, because you have better sense than that. And all this, and by the way, all this bless God, we're going to step on up by faith. Bless God. I'm not too sure about all this bless God stuff. Well, where do you get that from? Where did, what? Who are you to bless God? Just stop all that. We're going to stay above it. See, as it has been known for, for thousands of years, hundreds of years, there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. And some of you want to get those people back in front of you because you're about to go broke and you can't pay for your mansion and you can't pay for your Bentley. And you got to get into their face because you know that you got the kind of personality and charisma that you can you can you can drain their pockets dry if you can get in front of them, you lying devil. That's why you want to rush and get them in there. And and I, I knew that pastor down in Louisiana, I think he is uh, in Louisiana. I knew that he were he wasn't about anything. I knew he was not a true man of God. And it came out when he uh as soon as the the government paid everybody their money he up there telling the people to give give uh, give the, the ministry and other evangelists their money from a government check only a one thousand two hundred are you kidding me I know this sounds kind of crazy but twelve hundred dollars is not much money man at all. If you do everything you're supposed to do with it, it's already gone, and you still need more. And you're going to take the money from the old people, the old saints in the church, and you're going to call them and email them and text. Now, remember the church. When you get your check, you're a lie. Your feet ain't made, and your heart pumps peanut butter. Man, you need to go somewhere. Are you kidding me? And let me tell you, people, don't be so gullible. That you are, you're going to give your check that you thank God by the grace of God you got from the government and give it to the church. That's not income. That's not income. You don't have the time from that. Don't, don't give the preacher anything. Don't give the church anything. They need to give you some money. Don't you get mad with me. Some of you people, some of these preachers have lost their minds. I wouldn't give them a dime. I'll keep them because you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, well, God, if I give, if I give a, a, a seed offering, then God's going to bless me with some more money. From where? You don't have a job. From where? No, no, that's, see, there's a thin line between faith and foolishness. If you did that, you need to ask that pastor to give you your money back. Don't do that. Unless you got a whole lot of money, that's fine. But if you're struggling, you, you, you're barely making it, and you are 
got to go to a, a, a pantry every day to get a box of food for you and your children, I wouldn't give the preacher or the church a dime of that money. You a preacher, how dare you? I'm telling you the truth. That's not for the. That's not. That's not for that. Like I said, if you have if you have abundance, you got your own business, great, but not that money. That's to get you over and get you by until you find out what the world is going on. Don't be silly minded. And if you gave your money and you hurting right now, you gave three hundred dollars to the to the pastor to the church. If God give you peace, ask him for that money back. Ask him for the money back. I've already told the preachers, you need to sell your mansion, sell your Bentley and your three other cars you don't need, and buy your VW and get your double wide out in the country. Pay for it cash, you got the money, and live on the cheap like everybody else. Number two, last month in Kentucky, health officials traced more than 30 coronavirus cases and three deaths and community spread of the disease across multiple counties, including at a meat packing plant, back to a single church revival meeting in Hawkins County, Kentucky. You need to be prayerful, and you need to be careful. You, you, listen, you don't have to go to church. You don't have to go to the physical building. You can. Some of you, I guarantee you, there's over 2,000, close to 3,000 people right now. We've already had uh, uh, nearly 5,000 people already today in the previous two services. You're in church right now. What are you talking about? This is a briefing in you in church. I, I've already preached. I'm getting ready to preach again. I preach two or three times in these briefings. I just call them briefings to get you to come to church. What? You're in church right now, right at your house, lying down in the bed, sitting on the couch, in your robe, nodding your head, saying amen, amen, preacher. Mm -hmm. Slapping somebody, high-fiving. Uh, neighbor, what did he say? Mm-hmm. You're in church right now. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? We're in church right now. You don't need to go to the church building. Don't believe the okie doke, as they call it, the hype. And you, and I guarantee you, you have worshipped God more sincerely at home than you ever have at church. Now, we got some people uh, who they love the energy, the gregarious individuals. They feed off of people, and some people got the wrong motives. Some people just like to be around other people to look and see, see what they can get, you know, you know. I'm talking about those devils. For those, of, for those of you who are saved and who are born again, you, you have worshipped God in spirit and in truth. You ain't trying to impress anybody. You got gray hair going out of your head that you've never seen before. Uh, you don't have any makeup on. Uh, you don't, you're don't. you not wearing your red-bottom shoes. You're not wearing a $1,000 suit, sir. Bless your heart. You're not trying to impress anybody with your car. Mm. You haven't even showered. You just got your robe on. You're just going to go right on in church to wash your face, brush your teeth, give you, get yourself uh, a cup of coffee or some green tea and a bagel with some cream cheese, and you're ready to go with God. And your family. And you've got more of a blessing in those services than when you went to the building, because there ain't no showing off, ain't nobody trying to impress nobody. There's no hypocrisy. Everybody uh, knows everybody, and we know we're not about anything. 
So we're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. Number three, in California, a single church service on Mother's Day is being blamed for new clusters of the virus in Lake County and Mendocino County in Butte County. They are trying to track down 180 people who attended a church service in person in defiance of the state's public health order. Number four, last month, a CDC report traced a large cluster of cases in Chicago to one church service as one of the places where infections took place. Listen to me. This is a plague, what the world calls a pandemic. Ain't nobody trying to hurt nobody, no plague. The government's trying not trying. They don't hate the church like that. They were voted in by the church. What are you talking about? Stop following this made-up foolishness. It's made-up wars and made-up fights. Got you all rowdy. Yeah, that's right. They won't, they won't call us essential. I don't care what they call you. You better not meet together with a bunch of all the church members. Jim Jones. That's what they're going to call you, Jim Jones. They're going to call you Jim Jones. Mark my words, they're going to call you Pastor Jim Jones if you you uh, browbeat your people in coming out there. You got people who don't even want to go back to work and get money. It's not about the pay. It's not about the $600 extra. They are smart. Why would you go back out into the plague? That's just like if you know it's hailing you, 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 you hear the uh, uh, softball size hell knocking on your roof, breaking your windshield. Why would you go out into the hell? That's stupid. You're going out into death. Number five, another cluster of cases was traced to a church in rural Arkansas saw, where the pastor and his wife did not know that they were infected. But they were, and over the course of one week, they infected 38% of their congregation, almost half their church. And so far, three people have died. You want that on your on your conscience? You can answer to God for that, people. You, you, you do all this fighting and writing letters and emails and begging people to come. Let's get this church started back up again. We... we church is going down. We need for everybody to come. We'll try to do our best to protect you and uh, to keep you well and safe. And then you get together. You know how we are. We're going to be all doing all the hugging and, and kissing on the cheek. And everything. I'm not worried about it. I know God's going to protect us. I, I have my armor on and all that crazy talk. Crazy talk. Foolishness. You know how, you know, yeah, I'm, don't worry about it, honey. I, you know, God got us. <laughs> God got us. Yeah, you're going to be in the hospital. See, and that's going to be worse than death. See, I'm not afraid of death. I, I'm, I'm ready to die, man. God, is, God, God has been good to me. Man, God has taken me on a journey that's just unbelievable. I give him the glory, praise, and honor. I, I welcome death any time he wants it to happen. But I do not want to be in the hospital and have a disease that's choking the daylights out of me. And even my oldest daughter, Danny, can't come and see me and say goodbye. Oh, no. My family can't come and see no, we talking through the iPhone but badly because I can hardly talk. They put me on my stomach. I don't want to be in a hospital where the nurses don't even want to be near me. The doctors don't want to be near me. They looking at me like a dying man. No, sir. I'd rather not go that way. And I've told, I've asked the Lord to help me not to be, help me not to go down that road. That road. I don't want to go out that way. But if I must, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go. But I, I'd rather not. I'd rather not. 
And then number six, and I'll share four or six more tomorrow as well to help you understand what you're dealing with. And why do that when you can hear the preacher every day now? I know some pastors, I mean, some of the baddest pastors and preachers in America. They struck in the corn every day. They flat preaching every day. I mean, they flat getting it done. I'm talking about some real preachers. And they preached before this happened, but they, they, they've never preached like this. They don't even have a suit on, and they just preaching their hearts out. I love it. I love to see these pastors. They love their people. And they know their people don't know what's going on, and they're trying to encourage them and help them through the word. Number six, in the northern part of uh, the Navajo Nation, the number of cases per population in specific regions is higher than in the worst hit zip codes in New York City. Officials, listen carefully, officials, have traced the outbreak in these specific regions of Navajo Nation, which which is a part of three states, to a church revival in early March. In early March. And, 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 and then number seven, you know, and I will give you the details on this one tomorrow. You know about the church in Europe. And they had a special conference. And they had a special conference, and nobody meant any harm. But, but from what I understand, many people got sick, and some have died from that conference. They traced it, traced it back to the conference. Nobody's picking on the church. People are regarding the, this plague. But God, God has sent the plague. God is responsible for the plague. He has allowed the plague, and it is designed primarily to get the attention of the church. I know you don't like that because you think you're special. Well, you're not. And, and you're not even doing right by God, and you know it. And you know we deserve it. And I thank God that uh, over 75% of the people who are people of faith understand that this judgment, this plague is against us. And no, we don't need to march on Washington. We don't need to have a big meeting. We just need to find our closet and confess our sins and repent to God and get our hearts right with God. You say, preacher, how can I do that? I'm glad you asked. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God wants you to do all of that. Humble yourself, but not just that. Pray, not just that. But we, some, we got some people who will pray a little bit. And we got some folks who will confess. We're master confessors, but we're not master repentants. Seek God's face means get back to your first love, which I'm getting ready to read right now, and turn from your wicked ways. Preacher, let go of fine Sylvia. I know it's hard, but you got to do it. Pastor's wife, let go of Deacon Bo Peep. I know it's hard, but you got to do it. Those of you who are caught up looking at pornography and you're masturbating every day and you feel guilty all day long, you need to stop it. Those of you who have dabbled and dibbled into homosexuality and you support uh, the church allowing homosexuals to become active members of the church of Jesus Christ, you need to repent. You need to turn from your wicked ways. So-called Christian leaders who sit around and pal around with the president and agree with uh, everything he says about homosexuality and how he's going to 
expand their rights and so forth, and you don't say anything. You just laugh and giggle and acquiesce and uh, be a sycophant and uh, let him do that foolishness, damning this country and destroying the future of the church with constant persecution and lawsuits and everything else for years to come. We will trace it back to you, so-called national Christian leader, national pastor, hypocrite, phony, and fake, and you will answer to God for what you did. Black and white, with the black president and the white president. And by doing so and, and encouraging them to sanction homosexuality in the government, even up to the Supreme Court, which stands, if you will, in the stead of God as far as judgment is concerned in this nation. You will answer to God for the evil you've done. You've compromised, and you know it, and you already feel guilty, and you need to repent, and you need to apologize, and you need to step. They're not going to listen to you, and President Trump's not going to listen to you and turn all that stuff over uh, 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 and, and, and get rid of it. You ought to step. Get your gang of Christian leaders and say, we got to go. Because God has given you an opportunity to save this nation. But you're not doing it, and you don't want to do it. Because of your friend who died of AIDS. Because you got connections with homosexuals yourself because of your daughter and because of your son-in-law and their connections with the fashion industry, the homosexuals in the fashion industry. That's why you don't want to touch it. But the blood will drip from your fingers, Mr. President, and the blood will drip from your fingers, Christian leaders, so-called Christian leaders. The blood is dripping from your fingers from this 100,000. Black and white pastors, the black and white pastors who supported Obama and the black and white pastors who are supporting Trump. The blood is dripping from your fingers with your fake, phony, lying, inaccurate count of 100,000 when you know it's over 250,000. A quarter of a million souls have gone out into eternity. The blood is running continuously from your fingers. And all of you will answer to God for allowing this evil in the greatest country and the most blessed country in the history of the world outside of Israel under Moses and Joshua. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. These are the words of Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else... I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. That's why your church is being destroyed in your sight. Because you didn't do what God and Jesus told you to be, to do, and to be. And your candlestick, your church, is being removed because you were playing instead of praying. You were whoring around and lying and shucking and jiving and agreeing with the world and compromising with the world, worshiping their false gods. And you know what happened to the children of Israel, our example, when they did that. God does not play. As the old folk used to say, the will of God grinds slow, but it grinds sharp. Be not deceived.
God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can bank on that. The prophet Leonard Ravenhill said, Oh, my ministering brethren, much of our praying is but giving God advice. Our praying is discolored with ambition either for ourselves or for our denomination. Perish the thought. Our goal must be God alone. It is his honor that is sullied, his blessed son who is ignored, his laws broken, his name profaned, his book forgotten, his house made a circus of social efforts. My God, my God, shall we pray. Holy Father God, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for all of the pastors who have influence, even a little influence with this president, to press upon him to overturn the foolishness regarding the sanctioning of homosexuality in the government. We pray for all pastors in their denominations to have the courage to uh, turn their churches and denominations around from splitting over the abomination of homosexuality. And Lord, help families uh, to go back to believing that a marriage and families between a man born a man and a woman born a woman, and that anything other than this is a satanic attempt to turn your world upside down and uh, to the point where there's no return. So, Lord, in light of all of that, we praise you and we thank you for this plague. I pray that you will be thorough with us, break us, make us, and mold us, and help us to repent deep down in our hearts, in our closets, and get our hearts with, right with you. And pray to seek your face, to turn from our wicked ways, and humble ourselves, and get back to you, our first love, and produce fruits of repentance. For your glory, praise, and honor. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> now, dear friend of mine, if you're with us today and you do not know Jesus Christ in the free pardon of your sins as your Lord and Savior, allow me to show you how you can place your faith and trust in him for your soul's salvation from the power of sin and the punishment of sin, which is eternal hell fire. First, dear friend, please understand that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's laws. The Holy Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Please understand with me, beloved, that because of your sin, you deserve punishment in the lake of fire, the burning hell, and so do I. We all do. Romans 6.23, Daniel Ezekiel says, the wages of sin is death. This includes physical death and eternal death in that awful place called hell. Hell is a place of torment. Hell is a place that Jesus said is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Bible talks about that hell is a place of a tormenting memory. The Bible talks about how that hell is a place of outer darkness and the blackness of darkness forever. The Bible talks about, and I think this is the saddest aspect of hell, that once you go to hell, dear friend, you can't get out. There is no purgatory. 
There's no second chance. There's no limbo. Nobody can bail you out. Nobody can pray you out. Once you go to hell, once you die and go to hell, you are there and you are locked in forever according to the Holy Scriptures, the Holy Word of God, the Bible. In light of that bad news, I have some good news for you. Jesus Christ said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world. These are the most beautiful the happiest words in the history of the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His name is Jesus. And he was speaking of himself. That whosoever, these are the words of God, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Beloved, the phrase, for God so loved the world, means that if you are in this world, God loves you, no matter what you have done. The next phrase that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, refers to none other than Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley the King of kings and Lord of lords, Mary's baby, God's son, Jesus. He is God's son who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins and for mine. And he was buried and rose on the third day by the power of God. Our next phrase, beloved, is that whosoever believeth in him. The word whosoever simply means anybody at any time. Red, yellow, black, and white. We're all precious in God's sight. The phrase believeth in him means to trust in him, to depend upon him, to rely on him, to have faith in him for your soul's salvation. Since people are dying every day by the thousands, you need to hear this and you need to believe on Christ while you have a chance. There was a black man in Minnesota. I don't know what he did, but he didn't deserve what he got. He's dead today. And uh, somebody else is going to die today. It may be you. So you need... And he was not expecting to die, and you're not either. But we are all going to die, and so you need to hear the gospel, and you need to trust in Christ as Savior. Whosoever will, let him come. Our next phrase, should not perish, refers to that awful place called hell. which I've already mentioned to you. And lastly, the phrase, but have everlasting life, means to live forever in heaven with God. The Holy Bible says, beloved, in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou, you, shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou, you, shalt be saved. You don't have to be in a church to be saved. You don't have to give any money to the church to be saved or to the preacher. You don't have to Uh, get baptized to be saved. You don't have to join a church to be saved. You don't have to jump. You don't have to shout. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. All you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in your heart right now that Jesus Christ paid your sin debt. He paid it all as the songwriter said. 
Believe in your heart that he died for your sins. He suffered and he bled and he died for your sins. Was buried and rose on the third day, early one Sunday morning. And then pray and ask him, call on his name to save you. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Dear friend, I'll be glad to pray with you. I'll be glad to lead you in what is called the sinner's prayer. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart, believing in your heart in none other than Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, God's Son. Believe in your heart that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. And he'll save your soul today. And you will have your eternal life insurance policy. So let's pray. Holy Father God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and that I have done evil in your sight. I admit that I have broken your Ten Commandments. I have lied before. I've stolen things before. I've coveted after and lusted after people and things before. I have dishonored and disobeyed and disrespected my parents. I have also disrespected you by taking your holy name in vain, even with cursing. For Jesus Christ's sake, please have mercy and grace upon my soul. And please forgive me of all of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart that Jesus Christ died for my sins. He suffered, he bled, and he died for my sins. Was buried and rose on the third day. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and, to, and into my spirit and save my soul today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of all of my sins. And help me to turn from my evil life and to follow you in the new life, Lord Jesus. For it is in your name I pray. Amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you believed in your heart on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose on the third day, allow me to say to you congratulations on doing the most important thing in life. And that is trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and receiving him into your heart and spirit. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, please go to gospellightsociety.com and download my free book titled What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10:9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Dear friend, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior today, please email us at dw3 at Gospel Light Society and let us know. We have some free material that we want to send you immediately via email. If you have a prayer request, please email that to us as well. And we will pray for you until you tell us to stop. Until next time, my beloved, God loves you, we love you, and may God bless you real good is my prayer. Let's all stand for our closing prayer today. Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for what you have done even in this briefing. And we pray that millions would 
hear the gospel and be saved, millions of Christians would be revived and encouraged in the faith. And we pray that you would comfort, as only you can, those who are hurting like they have never hurt before because of death in the family, because of the plague. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for sake. Amen. God bless you, dear friends. Until next time. We'll see.